The rookies are walking around at the Giants facility, so why not talk about some jersey information we're getting around the season? Legacy, baby. It's back in big blue. We've also got a couple of little surprises along the way for Andrew Makowitz around Madden ratings. Not to mention, we know that it feels like it's a good vibe summer for the New York football Giants. Looking back at that depth chart heading into the offseason last year, what kind of thread can we pull on there as we try to build hope and optimism and a dream of the possibility of being a competitive team in the upcoming season? That's next. Oh, yes, my friends, it is OGP, the One Giant Podcast, where, as you know it, we are your host over here, Adam Armbrecht, covering the Brooklyn Nets and the Locked On Nets podcast with my boy Doug Nori and yonder there. It is the seasoned generational ticket holder, the healthy, wealthy, and wise home sitting for his young boy, Mr. Andrew Makowitz. Oh, if anyone is a, an avid listener of OGP, they know I have a two and a half year old, and nothing is worse when you get the phone call on a Monday that's like, hey, there was a, a COVID outbreak uh, sure. in, in your son's class. So we're just going to basically like shut it down for the week. So uh, here's your child back and uh, good luck for the week. And you're like, ah, well, there goes work. Work shot, right? My uh, bonus kid showed up at my mother's for daycare for my brother when uh, my second nephew, the oldest nephew, came in. I said, oh, why are you over at, why are you over at uh, grandma's house? He said, Coxsack Coxsackie at the school. <laughs> and I'm like, Okay, must be another outbreak. So there you go. It's always uh, nothing but fun times for the kids as he tries to enunciate Koksaki, which is obviously something very serious for the children. Now, friends, also very serious for the children. And by that, I mean the fans of the One Giant Podcast. We are like, you are like the children of this show. We are like the children of the Giants. We just want mom and dad to stop fighting and take us out to Arby's. The bottom line is, as we come into this off uh, through this off season. The training camp rookies are in there. As I said at the top, they're walking around. They're working out maybe a little bit. We don't get to get any information until next week officially kicks off. But we did get um, some fun, I think, information and news that the New York football giants are bringing back those sweet, sweet legacy jerseys, the throwback 80s, 90s style. You know, the red and white trim, the old school giants written on the side of the helmet. Uh, before we, <laughs> before I try nagging, it's a different type of energy when you go to the stadium and you see those, those old school jerseys on. Yeah. I mean, chef's kiss to the giants. Let's just start out the idea of them bringing back these jerseys. Like think about it. Anyone that grew up on those jerseys in the eighties and the nineties is now in their thirties or their forties or their fifties. And it just brings that nostalgia back of going to the Meadowlands when the giants you know, were at their peak in the eighties and nineties, you had those great defenses the fan base was amazing. The stadium was electric. I, it just it conjures up a lot of good thoughts. So the Giants saying that they're going to at least bring those jerseys back for two games next season got me all fired up yesterday. Now, um, chef's kiss or all fired up, whatever the opposite of that would be, might be the PR department because I, I, I'm a fan of it. And they brought back LT. LT passed the torch of the old school throwback jersey to Saquon Barkley. And yet... It was the most anticlimactic video with this just kind of <laughs> just I don't I don't know. I know that it's social media and who really cares, but I was like, oh man, um it's gonna be so cool when they show the video. If you're on the, the Giants email list, it shows LT looking out the car window and you think this is gonna be so much fun too. All right. He kind of sat down and said, Hey man, this is for you. So I guess you'll wear that then. And uh we'll move on to say nothing of the awkwardness of Blake Martinez's guttural yell in the locker room, which was just spaced out enough to have it feel like they were like now three, two, one roar. And there we go. It, it felt so I liked the idea that they had Adam. If anyone hasn't, if anyone hasn't seen it, 
It's Saquon Barkley sitting by his locker. He puts on headphones and they pan to what's in his hand. And it's a cassette player. And you just know it's going to be good. You're like, whatever's coming next. This has got that old school feel. And then from there, it just felt like it went downhill. And to, to your point, like I was excited about it. The fact that the jerseys are amazing kind of makes everything a little bit okay. Yeah. yeah, like they just look great. It, may, it makes everything okay. I will say one other small tidbit. Like LT, arguably the greatest defensive player in the history of football. Sure. But also he like kind of has a checkered past with drug abuse and being arrested and finding himself in very precarious situations. I'm unfamiliar he, with the stories. Yeah. I mean, we don't need to go into them in, in great detail. Some of them are not very flattering. It's like, why not pick somebody like Phil Sims, right? Like Phil Sims could have been a perfect guy who bridged the eighties and nineties teams. feels like uh, LT was, was a little bit on the, on the edgier side for the giants to pick given his history. Why not? Um, why not have a whole collection of, of those players, right? Like why not have Ooh, even better, like a montage. Guys? Well, I mean, you know, it's a Phil Sims. Like you say, he could be handing it to Daniel Jones and why don't you bring in, uh, you know, Tyrone Wheatley to hand it off to Saquon Barkley, Rodney Hampton you, or something, right? right? You know, yeah. yeah. I don't know why I went to Tyrone Wheatley. I mean, Hey, they, they, Hey, listen, they're all good. They're all, they're all, they're all in my mind. Uh, yeah. But like, why not? And, and listen, I know that it's like a little bit beyond that, that time frame necessarily, but Amani Toomer wore those jerseys, right? Like why not have Toomer Pat? Like, Guys, make the connections here. We're not going to waste too much time on this, but um, basically, we're saying say, we could have done a better job with that video. If they're going to release something awesome like those jerseys, get a little bit more creative. Like the cassette tape, I thought was the start, and it ended up being the best part about it, which was unfortunate. It's always a bad sign when the start is actually the finish. Now, the other thing we're going to get into here, uh, I'm going to save the. I, I mentioned about the idea. There's some Madden ratings out there. There's one that I just wanted to have, kind of have a conversation around. Another one that I thought was really exciting, but. Do you? I'll let you steer the ship here, Andy. Do we want to get into this good vibe summer and and where the roster was a year ago to where it is today, or do you want to do you want some shock and awe with one of the most exciting possible matting ratings to be uh, revealed? All right. Well, so the Madden thing is top of mind on Twitter right now. So let's hit up the Madden stuff okay. really quick, and then we can do the snapshot of 2021 between 2022. Buddy, I love it. So. Uh, Madden delight. Here's the first thing that we can talk about, which is not nearly as exciting and maybe a little bit concerning, depending on how you think about it. The Madden ratings for wide receivers, um, <laughs> Sterling Shepard is actually up top there with an 82 overall rating ahead of Kenny Galladay at 81, 79 for Kadarius Tony, which I think is, you know, right where you want to be. I could be explosive and all of a sudden be an 85 midway through the year. Darius Slayton, a 77 and then you end up with Richie James Jr. at a 76 there. Now, before I get into, uh, you know, obviously, Wandell Robinson, um, is it concerning to you that our best wide receiver is a, is a receiver that might not play for us? I, I mean, why, why do you say that he might not play for us? What, what, what are you saying by that? Oh, no. More for Sterling Shepard to get out there on the field for the New York Football Giants. But there's a good chance that he's not going to be there. And I just... It, 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 you know, little ring a ding ding alarm bells when then you talk about, uh, you know, I will just fill it out here. Um, the only one really of note is 72 for Wandell Robinson. Um, I, I, I'm not, there's no judgment on these, on these ratings because I, I can't tell you or quantify what anyone is. And then you have actually, uh, Jordan Aikens, uh, popping up there at 71 along with Colin Johnson, 70 and down the list we go. But, yeah, but, but, but what do you think about, does that feel, does that actually feel like, I know it's Madden. We get that. We're talking about real life football. But that's a nice little clump of guys in the in the in the upper seventies into the eighties. Not not falling behind, not showing off in the meaty part of the curve. Well, Adam, the simple thing is like, where do we expect these guys to be? Right, like the the Giants I'm, had. I'm, I'm actually pleasantly surprised that Kenny Galladay is in the eighties, and I'm not saying he's not capable of being a better player than that. But given the injuries and everything else, you're like, I wouldn't be shocked if they're like, I don't know, how do how could we know what this guy is anymore? I mean, think about it. Guys like Jalen Waddle and CeeDee Lamb are are immense talents. They're they're 87s, right? They're they're down towards the back end of the top 20. The Giants don't have a top 20 as it sits today. Yep. Wide receiver on their roster. Kadarius Tony has the talent to maybe get there, but they couldn't put him higher given the fact that he was injured half the time and had a couple of big games, but wasn't necessarily as consistent as he as he could be. So like I, I think the the ratings are kind of where they should be. Uh, obviously, as a Giant fan, it's frustrating not having a top 15, top 20 wide receiver in, in any of these rankings. But 
Does it, I mean, does it really matter? I, it's fun that it gets people riled up though. No, but Wandell Robinson should be above Richie James. I don't think Richie James has done anything in his NFL career to say that you couldn't look at the prospects of Wandell Robinson and say he should be higher. Again, it's Madden, but this is the one that I really want to get to. Click. How about this, Andy? It fills up most of the screen here. Top 10 running backs by speed. Anything jump out there at you? Anybody on that list just kind of grab your attention and go, oh, my, my, my. Oh, you want me? It must be Raheem Mostert being number one, right? Is that what, <laughs> that what you're trying to push me towards? Yeah, or, Ken, or Kenneth Walker at six? Is that where you wanted me to go, Adam? Uh, clearly, be. clearly, when you're talking about speed for running backs, the, the big one there for us is the one that is a giant, which is number seven, and that's Matt Breida. Yeah, listen, man, I just... It, for what it's worth, and we're, we're putting this into the context of how we've talked about him all offseason. He's a nice balance, a nice compliment. Listen, if you're top 10 in, in speed, I get it's Madden, but it also translates to what you can do on the football field. That matters. Like, you're talking about a guy that if you can just give him a quick little pitch and say, hey, you know what a straight line looks like? Go ahead and run for it, right? Like, that is a nice balance point for the New York Giants to have on their roster. I'm using Madden as the backdrop. I do think that's pretty exciting, though, especially at the very least that we're not going to see a lot of our players top on the Madden list. Well, I will say this, Adam, because take it with a grain of salt, because while it is positive to see your players higher up on some of these ranking lists, sure. yeah, perfectly, you put uh, Matt Breida at, at number seven at 93. Just I want you to make sure that you think back to last year, because we had a wide receiver that was in the top 10 of speed with a Madden rating of 96 in speed. And that is one John Ross, who's not even on an NFL roster and didn't really contribute at all last year. So, like, you were it, high on good. him, weren't you? I, I was. I, I think he was a, a, a low risk flyer yeah, that, yeah. you know, has that high, has high, top high being a very yeah, loose term. Yes. In, in terms of being able to take the top off of a defense, clearly that didn't work out. But hey, listen, you'd rather have a really fast guy than a really slow guy in the NFL, right? That's it. That's, you know, listen, we're, we're, we're trying to have a good time, some good vibes. And as you say, last year, maybe there were some guys that had some high ratings. This year, uh, maybe not as many, but we pull on those threads when we can. And interestingly enough, it leads us into what really is the bulk of, of our conversation today. And I'm just calling it the good vibe summer because that's what it feels like, right? We've got these young draft picks. We have the new regime. Joe Shane is in. He's kind of throwing some some hate backwards at the pre previous uh, GM and saying, listen, we got what we got. And it creates some some a little bit of anxiety around this offseason and training camp because every day is going to be who's checking the boxes. How can we guarantee we have the depth at this position, right? So this is an exciting little bit, a little bit of angst, but it's a, it's been a very positive summer, a very positive offseason for the New York football giants. And it, it, it makes me and you think back to last year at this time in the offseason and not only the turnover, but also whether or not we can gauge where we actually are in terms of those good bots. Yeah. So this was something that you and I had talked about. Cause it's like, man, 2021, uh, when they released their first depth chart, uh, last August, we kind of looked at the roster and said, well, there are certainly holes all over this roster. And that was right. You know, yeah. that was months after Dave Gellman said, we clearly, uh, evaluate our talent much differently than scouts and media and fans and everybody oh God, else. But all of us, that. All of us basically said, Jesus. no, the offensive line is porous. It's horrible. How did you not address it at all? And he's like, trust me on this one. I got this. And when you look back at 2021, right. Adam, like the first thing that pops out is you look at August unofficial depth chart released by the Giants. And clearly you have like looking at the offensive line, you're like, what on earth made anyone think that this was a good idea? Yeah, you're talking about right tackle. Obviously, again, this is in August, by the way, not what ended happened during the season. Matt Pert at right tackle, right guard, Will Hernandez, and your center, Nick Gates. Now, Nick Gates obviously goes down with a big injury. You have Shane Lemieux and Andrew Thomas, left guard and left tackle. But but to your point, that right side of the line and speculating on what a third-round pick was going to maybe be able to do for the New York football giants in Matt Pert. Will Hernandez, a guy that had had a very up and down track record as it was coming in. And yet, to your point, I almost forget it. When a GM comes out and says, well, we obviously evaluate what we have a little bit higher than those on the outside. You end up going, yeah, but like these are these were question marks, regardless of whether or not you think their ceiling could be a bit higher. Right. Or in the case of a Will Hernandez, this guy had already shown you that he was going to struggle. 
that he it was not going to be the future of the position. And you chose not to address that in any way, shape, or form. And then, listen, you fall down on hard times around Nick Gates. But that's three-fifths of the line that you clearly went into the season saying, we'll see. And after one injury to Nick Gates, done. <laughs> done. By the way, Nate Solder ended up starting, right? Will Hern- uh, Matt Pert didn't even end up working out there. Will, Will Hernandez had a very consistent Will Hernandez type season. Um, just disgusting. I'll, I'll put it that way. I, and I know, I know we're going to compare it to what we have this year, but it's just, it's just so hilarious to look back at that now, knowing what the year turned out to be and say, good Lord, how did you possibly think that was going to pan out? Well, and then you have Ben Bredesen, you throw yeah, in yeah, uh, yeah. the trade for Billy Price. Like we, we were just throwing like just stuff at the wall and hoping that year, something yeah. stuck because like there was no, there was literally nothing we could do because they realized after week one, man, we really made a mistake. We didn't address the offensive line properly. But I mean, even looking across the rest of the roster, Adam, like look, look at the starting two tight ends. You have Evan Ingram, who's no longer here. You have Caden Smith, who's still a free agent and hasn't been signed since then. And and you just look ac- across everything and you're like, man, going into the season, this the depth on this team was just not good. Very interesting on the defensive side of the ball. I think there's like a lot a big conversation to have there, but you just mentioned at the tight end position and I liked Caden Smith, right? I mean, like there was, a, I think there was a point along the way where I said, listen, you can just go ahead and should be cutting ties with Evan Ingram and just run with Caden Smith for a season. But feather in your cap when we're talking about Daniel Bellinger, like if I could go back last year and go into the season with Daniel Bellinger as the number one on my tight end depth chart, I'd rather have that than have had, Evan Ingram and and Caden Smith and everybody else that was in there, guys. That by the way, when you look at that tight end room, that is one, two, three, and four, five. Yeah, five or six guys, including Kyle Rudolph. By the way, he's all the way at the back end of the depth chart because he started the the season injured. Even though they gave him that big contract, you have six tight ends that aren't even being aren't even a, a, a glint in the New York Football Giants eye. One off season later, absolutely insane. We understand it's a new regime as well. And, and Adam, uh, we can talk about the defensive side of the ball. There's a lot to go there. Um, do you want to talk about the defensive side or just overall roster? That's something that I noticed. Uh, yeah, go. Yeah, hit the overall roster here because I think there's some good talking points inside the defense. But this is the, from last year to this year, not only who's not here, but also where they are now. Yeah, so that's the big thing is like, okay, we've moved some of these players out. We have new players. But like, it really, we really need to take a look back and say, where did those players go? Did other teams offer more money for them? Did they want to go home to a different destination where they're from? Like, how did it all play out? And the craziest part is when you look at this unofficial depth chart from August of 2021, not a single free agent who signed with another team this offseason got a multi-year deal. They all got one-year veteran minimum-ish Prove it deals. Evan Ingram was the only one that got a, a decent one year situation down in Jacksonville, um, you know, multi million dollar deal. Everyone else, veteran minimums. And then when you think about it, it's like, okay, aside from the players like Will Hernandez, who signed one year contracts, or Jabril Peppers, who signed a one year, $2 million deal with the Patriots, everyone else is still a free agent on the market today. They haven't even been able to latch on to another team. You look at people like Billy Price, Caden Smith. Sam Beal is listed on there. John Ross is listed on there. Kyle Rudolph is still a free agent. You're talking about 15% of the roster, Adam, maybe even 20 if we actually broke down some of these names on here one by one that are literally still free agents that no other team wanted or wants today. And to me, that speaks volume about talent evaluation and the lack of depth that we had and talent on the roster in general. You mentioned Sam Beal in there too, because I remember going back to last season, right? He kept he kept sticking around the roster much longer than anyone anticipated. He was a bit, you know, took the third round compensatory pick. It didn't work out, had the injuries, couldn't quite crack the roster, but he kept giving him these chances. This is always what we talk about around, hey, listen, the name that you know because he's been here need not still be here. You can take anybody under 25 years old and say, we're going to take a shot on this player and see if it pans out. And in some ways, a lot of the best organizations do this throughout the year. And we did. I do remember trying to applaud a little bit of what the organization was trying to do. Something they hadn't done in years past was like, Hey, be active on when when players are getting cut, when players are getting released in season, when you can put in your waiver claim, right? Like be active and trying to turn over this roster and continue to bring in new talent. But you have to be willing to cut ties sooner with a lot of these players. Some of which are ones, you know, unfortunately for me, Lorenzo Carter, right? I would have liked him to see him get brought back. He ends up going to Atlanta. You're, Maybe 
it ends up working out for him in the grand scheme of things. And he can be a, a quality contributing player on a roster, but he was a guy that was getting starting reps, right? And we were trying to determine whether or not he could be someone the Giants should retain. Now we're talking about this year could be whether or not he remains an NFL viable contributor. Right. And, and Adam, yeah, Lorenzo Carter is another perfect example. I mentioned Jabril Peppers before. All these players signed one year. Lorenzo Carter's deal with Atlanta was one year, three and a half million dollar deal. They're not, this is not big deals that, that, giant players because their talent is so great are being pulled away. And the most ironic thing of all this, and I was going to hit you with this as a little bit of a surprise, there was a giant on this roster that ended up getting a multi-year deal this off season. Do you have any idea off the top of your head who it was? No, I figured you'd say that. Do you want to know who it was? It was, Former giant BJ Hill, who Dave oh, you know Gettleman, what? I was scanning through the list. Yeah, Dave Gettleman decided to trade away BJ Hill for Billy Price of the Cincinnati Bengals. Billy Price is a free agent, can sign with anyone today. You know where BJ Hill is? He's the the freshly minted three year, thirty million dollar man for the Cincinnati Bengals. Yep. So like, it's not only are we devoid of talent, but we couldn't even evaluate our talent properly thinking BJ Hill what was sh was was shipped off for a bag of balls it's insane to me well and that is so when we look at this defensive side of the ball this is the the ultimate i don't know the ultimate extra kick in the pants when you talk about it's a new regime and you're trying to turn over the roster some key decisions that the previous regime made actually did you know, punitive damage going forward you mentioned BJ Hill and we're talking about inside that defensive front room okay, we have Dexter Lawrence and we know that we have Leonard Williams and we're going to wait and see how these young guys on the edge work out. But having a guy like BJ Hill still on this roster would be the exact perfect piece to maintain going forward. Maybe Dexter Lawrence shifting to the outside and having Leonard Williams and Dexter Lawrence. And then you could be using BJ Hill in the middle. A guy like Austin Johnson, this is more financially, you end up not being able to make the same decisions because of where you commit other money along the way. To say nothing of the fact you traded in a way, as you mentioned, for Billy Price and a bag of balls that ends up not being anything. And one of your solutions was Danny Shelton, a player that the second we all saw him in a New York football Giants uniform said, no, no, that's not a big boy. That is just a fat man, right? That is not going to work out for us in terms of trying to turn over this roster. So I, I find it fascinating, specifically on the defensive side of the ball. Some of the players that could have still been here get stripped away. We know the financial hole that they're put in. So you're going to start to have to pull the plug on a lot of guys like James Bradbury, Jabril Peppers, injury, et cetera. We, we, we get that. Logan Ryan being another example here, whether or not to fit inside of the organization, you knew you financially were going to be strapped for him as well. And what we end up getting to is, talking about as i mentioned the back end of this team okay xavier mckinney was destined to be a starter right and we think he's going to be a stud julian love veteran holdover he right now is tentatively earmarked as the other starter at the safety position at, at cornerback we know we have a dory jackson james bradbury is gone and you know the guy that might be we think is in line to be a starter across from him and what we have high hopes for him Robbins, who was high in sale on the, on the, on the early offseason depth chart a, a year ago. Does this give you any pause around how excited we are around some of the youth, the change in regime, the draft class we have coming in, and then saying, if we agree that our roster was not the strongest last year, where are we now? when we can look and see some talented players that are no longer part of this team. Yeah. The, the big thing. when I look at that roster is it's just every mistake was compounded by another mistake yeah. is what it felt like. Right. Like you mentioned the BJ Hill getting traded away and then they signed Danny Shelton. That's like two mistakes. It's like you traded away BJ Hill and you got Billy price and he played and he played very poorly across a terrible offensive line. Another compound mistake. You talked about Logan Ryan. He was a free agent that we signed late in the process. He played well for the Giants. And then they give him a multi-year, $10 million a year contract for an aging 30-plus-year-old veteran who then, you know, Joe Shane finally decides, okay, I need to cut bait and just cut my losses. But all these things are just compound mistakes that made that roster so in inefficient, so so haphazardly put together. Mm -hmm. and, and, and so finally, you fast forward to this year, and Joe Shane says, we can no longer go on with this offensive line. Like we acknowledge what everyone else knew that, you know, Dave Gettleman decided he did not want to address, which is we have to fix the offensive line. 
They draft a first round draft pick in Evan Neal to solve the right tackle. They go out and, and spend the most dollars in free agency that they had, albeit it was a small sum, to shore up the right guard in Glowinski. They go, they go out and, and put a third round pick into, into the guard spot in Joshua Zudu. They go out and get Max Mar- Garcia and Gano. They, they, they specifically said, we are not going to let this be our Achilles heel again and again. We've identified that it's a problem. And if it means we got to cut someone like James Bradbury or we got to clear up cap space, then so be it because we cannot continue to compound all of these mistakes. And that was the one other thing that, that I did take a look at here and we'll get out the door. It, you're always going to bring in veterans. You need to feather that line. But when I looked inside, especially on the defensive side of the ball and you go, you know what? I don't. And then some of these guys had injuries over the course of last season. I don't know what Cam Brown is or is not, but do I need to have uh, Odin Ingbo on this roster ahead of him and, and, you know, and having him at the fight through that as opposed to baptism by fire. This is, this is about the perspective of what you thought your team could accomplish from a wins and losses standpoint last season, right? You, you come and you say, we brought in Reggie Raglan. All right. I don't know if Carter Coughlin is destined to be a contributor on the defensive side of the ball or more of a special team standout, but what, why do I need Reggie Ragland in his way, right? Let's find out if that young player has talent or not. Because now, this year, that's what this regime is doing. Because guess what? They didn't get rid of Carter Coughlin. They didn't get rid of Cam Brown, right? They looked at it and said, probably we have incomplete, right? Inconclusive on these players. And maybe a better sample size would have pushed them in one direction or the other. But you don't get that opportunity when you philosophically don't understand where your franchise is versus where it wants to go and what you need to accomplish in the short term. Yeah, you can see that they're giving every opportunity for the young guys to start. You look at Evan Neal, he's he's going to be solidified as as the right tackle. You look at Thibodeau, obviously first-round pick, he's going to get on the field as soon as possible. But we've mentioned it ad nauseum. Dane Belton is going to get an opportunity to play early yeah. and and often. And he might even, you know, we've said it before, we're, we're bullish on the idea that he might even get start a starting opportunity in week one. That's how good he is. And you think about guys like Cordell Flott potentially being able to play in the slot, depending on Darnay Holmes. This regime seems more open to having some of these younger guys be able to play very early on. And, you know, whereas the previous regime would say, let's just go with a, a veteran like Nate Solder over Matt Pert week one, because we're going to go with what we think is the safe pick rather than what could benefit the franchise in the long term. Yeah, and uh, we're, I actually had a little uh, little this day in history that I thought we'd close out the show on, have some fun summer vibes. I will say, just back on the offensive side, by and large, the offensive line has been drastically shifted and overhauled here. But the skill positions, you know, I know the tight end group looks a lot different, but wide receivers and the running back room, really it's, hey, okay, Booker out, Brita in, right? But it's, it's Saquon Barkley, and then you're saying, hey, We'll see what happens with Sterling Shepard. It's Kenny Galladay. It's still at this point, Darius Slayton. It's Kadarius Tony. We added in a Wandell Robinson. And I think maybe just, you know, for fans that, that, that believe that Daniel Jones can show up, I think it is the idea of, Hey, look, we improved the thing in front of you and you still have all these weapons around you, right? So you can go forward and hopefully have yourself a successful season. That being the case though, uh, by the way, just to be clear here, these are, Good vibe summers. This is what we're, yes. we're having a good vibe summer. That whole that whole last 10 to 12 minutes that we just did where it sounded like we got real depressed and, and dejected but around that the was, Giants, that was good vibes. That was good vibes because we're talking about how much better it is in 2022. We went back and we're, we're doing the postmortem on 2021, but we addressed the offensive line. We, we, we're getting younger. Exactly. We're getting better talent. Like That, to me, is progress and a step in the right direction. Do you know then, Andy, at the end of the day, on this day in history, do you know what happened this day in history in 1858? Mm. Uh, it, was a cold, it, it was it was a it was a cold winter night, Adam. That's all I can remember from that day. And just to be clear, you think that on this day in July, I meant summer night, cold summer cold, night. It was a, a cold, cold summer winter. night. That's what I meant. That's how the that's unseasonably how unseasonably cold. Unseasonably cold. They say the first fee was charged for a baseball game. New York beat Brooklyn 22 to 18. How much do you think they charged? to see New York versus Brooklyn, Major League Baseball, 1858. I don't even know if they were using the right currency, but, uh, the currency they're using today. I'm going to go with <laughs> it was five actually, cents. It was I'm still Bitcoin. five cents. Wouldn't you believe it? Bitcoin, it, it, it had to make a comeback <laughs> from there. 50 cents. 50 oh. cents. Uh, you know, and you know what? 1858 sounds a little high to me. 
Sounds I know. Like I was going to say that sounds like eleven billion dollars if I wanted to go to Yankee Stadium today. So that's a little bit of a price gouge. You can, of course, get us over on YouTube. Uh, get the podcast feed. Get those needs fulfilled. The 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 rookies they're, they're sniffing around. They're checking out the lockers. They're looking at those legacy jerseys, maybe. And we know we're building towards next week when we are going to have everyone in camp, and we'll start to get some pads banging on pads here and see if we can start to get this sample size to keep that good vibe summer going. Let's see that young talent starting to claim their rightful places on this roster. Until next time, though, friends, as Andy Makowitz would want, need, and nay, demand the people know. As always, let's go Big Blue.